will present its argument. Mr. Chernoff, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walgren, and thanking you for the six weeks that you've spent here. That's, that's certainly above and beyond the call of duty. And I noticed you took more notes than we even did, and I appreciate that. I can't hear you, Counsel. I'm sorry about that. I, and I appreciate that. I bet you're wondering how I'm going to address uh, that argument. Um, and I'm going to tell you very simply this. Mr. Walgren's argument is exactly why in this country we have the right to a jury trial. Because no matter what a prosecutor, whatever misleading or, or inaccurate things a prosecutor says, in this country, it's the jury that gets to take the evidence back. It's the jury that gets to take a look at the evidence. And it's the jury that gets to analyze the charge. Now, Mr. Walgren says in his says, there's a reason why, let me see, he tells you, we don't have to go into the nature of propofol, he tells you. You know enough about propofol. We won't talk about that. There's a reason why he said that. He gives you bits and pieces of statements from witnesses. He doesn't give you the whole context of the statements, and he doesn't have you listen to the whole statement. You get to do that. And there's a reason why he didn't do that. Most disturbing of all, he tells you that he doesn't have to prove a direct and causal connection to the death of Michael Jackson when prosecuting Dr. Murray. That's the most disturbing thing because that's exactly what he has to do. And what the law says specifically, what it will tell you is, there may be more than one cause of death, an act or a failure to perform a legal duty causes the death only if it is a substantial factor in causing the death, not that all it has to be is a substantial factor. You have a full charge that discusses that, and we're going to go through that. Now, as Mr. Warren's telling you that, you know, he told you about what a wonderful entertainer Michael Jackson it was, and he, he was, we all know that, and about how hard this is on his family, of course it was. And how bad a doctor Dr. Murray was. And he tells you how... Dr. White used to be a good scientist. But what he forgets to tell you, what he absolutely thoroughly doesn't tell you, is that the prosecution during these six weeks have absolutely failed to prove a crime. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Hmm? Sorry, we did this yesterday, so please bear with me. I'm learning how to do it. So, which was the point? Mr. Warren spent an hour and a half talking about negligence. And we told you on opening statement, I told you that we would not be disputing negligence. We would not be telling you that Dr. Murray didn't make any mistakes. We would never say that. And throughout this case, we never did. And we're not doing it now. But this, this case that you're deciding, it isn't a medical board hearing. This isn't a civil lawsuit. There's not, this is not about money. It's about liberty. And for a crime, for a crime to be proved, you also have to show that Dr. Murray, the prosecution has to show that Dr. Murray actually killed Michael Jackson. And during his argument, the only thing he addressed, the only thing he addressed to even get close to that, and I'm going to explain why in a bit, was baggy pants. Not only does Mr. Warren have to show criminal negligence, he has to show that the specific act, and you have to be unanimous on this, 
the specific act that he says is criminally negligent, and there's some that aren't, was the cause. Was the cause. And you have to be unanimous on that. Otherwise, this isn't a crime. The medical board may address it. That's a possibility. But we're here because this has been charged as a crime. I want to talk to you about unchangeable, undisputed facts first. And this does have to do, has to relate to the character and nature of propofol. And you're going to see why it's important. And I want to show you these facts first. This is a timeline that we can rely on. And Mr. Wargan told you all about phone calls that were made, and he implied that things were going on during that time without proving anything. What we do know is this for sure, that Dr. Murray found Michael Jackson not breathing, found him in distress at 12 noon. Now, you may think Dr. Murray's a sinner. You may think Dr. Murray's a saint. But for whatever reason, whatever you think of him, if all he cared about, which I believe, all he cared about was, the, was Michael Jackson and the safety of Michael Jackson, the very first thing he's going to do when he finds him not breathing and potentially dead is try to revive him. That's the first thing he's going to do. If you think he's a sinner, if that's what you think, then just to save his own neck. Just to make sure that his meal ticket is set up. But for whatever reason, that is an unchangeable fact that Dr. Murray is going to immediately try to revive him. Now we know, and you can't really see that, but let me tell you what it, what it says. We know that at 1151, Sade Anding received a phone call from Dr. Murray. And we know, according to Sade Anding's testimony, that she listened for about two minutes before hanging up. That puts this in it. Dr. Murray, during the period of time from 11.18 to 12 noon, was on the phone. During that period of time, from 11.18 to 12 noon, he was on the phone. If he had found Michael Jackson during that period of time, then what, had happened, then what would have happened with Sade Anding is exactly what would have happened anywhere within that period of time. During those 42 minutes, from 11.18 to 12 noon, Dr. Murray would have been off the phone trying to revive Michael Jackson. So what do we know? We know that from 11.18 to 12 noon, Dr. Murray never found Michael Jackson not breathing. Now, he could have been on the phone next to him. He could have been emailing next to him. He could have been in the closet. He could have been in the foyer. But one thing we know for sure is he never found Michael Jackson not breathing for those exact 42 minutes. When you look at the nature of propofol, What you, dis what, you learn what you know, unchangeable facts from the experts, is that propofol is a 10-minute drug by injection. If you don't merely give an injection, let's say you have a procedure that takes longer than that, then the only way to keep propofol actually working is through a drip. That's the only way to do it. Now, we know that propofol only can be administered either by IV injection or IV drip. We know that because Dr. Schaefer and Dr. White both investigated the possibility of oral propofol. So here's what we know. We know that if prior to 11.18 a.m., Dr. Murray had given an injection, just like he told the police. If prior to that time, Dr. Murray 
had given an injection any time within those 28 minutes, just like he told the police. Then by the time he left at 11.18, as long as we're talking 10 minutes, 11.08, 11.03, or anything before that. Now remember, he said 10.50. And you will notice that on the, from the phone records, the time he said he gave the injection, he was off the phone. If that's what Dr. Murray did, just like he told the police, then by 11.18, no matter what he was doing, no matter what, there was absolutely no danger. There was no chance of harm to Michael Jackson based on what Dr. Murray knew he gave Michael Jackson. That's indisputable. Because of that, because the prosecution knows that, they spent six weeks trying to prove a drip. Because without a drip, without a drip, then what Dr. Murray gave Michael Jackson absolutely would not have harmed him without an unusual and intervening circumstance. And so they spent five, six weeks discussing a drip. Now you will, you will note that all of the things that Dr. Schaefer said in his testimony, the prosecution didn't mention to you. They didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about all the things that occurred during Dr. Schaefer's testimony, about during Alberto Alvarez's testimony, during Elisa Fleek's testimony. They didn't talk to you about that because they know they know that during that period of time, during the, those witnesses, it became clear that what the prosecution was doing, what they were attempting to do, was to create a drip that never existed. And they absolutely refuse to accept the most obvious and reasonable explanation for all of this that Dr. Murray actually gave Michael Jackson exactly what he said he did. And the reason they refuse to accept it is because they won't tell you what they really want. They want you to convict Dr. Murray for the actions of Michael Jackson. They just don't want to tell you that. So they give you all these, well, you know, check out the baggy pants. That's for you to decide but they just won't tell you what they really want. I want, to, I want to show you the genesis of the prosecution's drift. Mr. Waldron says in opening statement, whether or not this was followed by a continuous drift is for you to decide. He never goes out on a limb on that. And then comes Alberto Alvarez. Now, Alberto Alvarez sat on this chair and with tears welling up in his eyes, told you that it has been so hard for him, so difficult since the death of Michael Jackson. He can't, can't get employment, he tells you. Oh, sure, he's had a couple of celebrity clients and you know, he's ashamed to say that he's sold on that basis. They, the agency sells him on that basis. He tells you that, that it's just been so hard. And, and, uh, and then you learn that Alberto Alvarez has been offered $500,000 for a story. Now, how did Alberto Alvarez go from a story that's worth $9,000 <laughs> to a story that's worth half a million dollars. Because you know from Kai Chase testifying that that's what her story was worth when all she did was see Dr. Murray uh, up on the stairs. So how did, he, how did that happen? How did it happen that Alberto Alvarez, when he first spoke to the police on June 25, 2009, all he did was call 911? But two months later, August 31st, 2009, more than two months later, all of a sudden, he didn't just call 911. He comforted the children 
He tried to breathe life into Michael Jackson. He hid evidence for Dr. Murray. All of a sudden, his story became monumentally more compelling and more valuable. Now, do you honestly believe that when this is over and you go home to your families, like I do, do you honestly believe that Alberto Alvarez is not going to cash in? Honestly? Two months later, Alberto Alvarez, despite the fact Despite the fact that this, he tells you, this, these facts are just burning into him, bothers him so much, thinks about it every day, it takes two months for him to talk to the police. The reason was given, scheduling. Here's a guy without a job. So the police come two months later because their schedules mesh. And they meet at his lawyer's office, along with Fahim Muhammad and Michael Lemire Williams. Alberto Alvarez testifies that Dr. Murray, who barely knows him, they're barely an associ associate. I mean, they, 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 I think he said good morning once he testified. For some reason, Dr. Murray, who had all the time in the world to hide whatever he wanted, and Mr. Walgren said so himself, he chose Alberto Alvarez to hide vials for him, to hide bags for him. He chose Alberto Alvarez, according to Alberto. But despite that, Alberto tells you this during cross-examination. I placed Michael Jackson down on the floor during the 911 call. Gently placed him on the floor. I grabbed his legs. Dr. Murray grabbed his shoulders. Before I did that, Dr. Murray had to pull out the IV. Before we did that, Dr. Murray had to put a pulse oximeter on his finger. And then I grabbed his legs gently. Dr. Murray grabbed his shoulders gently, and we laid him on the floor. That was his testimony. When I played in the 911 call, you saw how he looked up on the stand because he realized that was impossible. And you get that 911 call, take it back with you and take a listen. I asked Alberto Alvarez, did you take, show us how you took off that bag and he grabbed it right at the top, as you recall. And he curled it around this, this metal hook. Remember that? And he grabbed it exactly where, if you look at the bag, and you get to have that as well, where the fingerprint boxes were, where later they fingerprinted that bag. Exactly where you would expect those fingerprints to be. But here's the problem, though. They were not Alberto Alvarez's. That's been stipulated to. And those fingerprints were identifiable. Alberto Alvarez says, well, there was a milky substance in the back. It's, it's clear. It tested negative for any drug. There's nothing in that bag. Nothing. He tells you that he performed CPR until the paramedics arrived. In fact, he told you that, that he placed, carefully placed Michael Jackson on the floor before the paramedics arrived, and you, you met Richard Sennett, who you know has no axe to grind, who told you, I walked in, Michael Jackson's on the bed, and no, he's not doing CPR. I asked Alberto Alvarez to go through with me all the things that he did during the period of time that he uh, was in the room. And 
We know from Alberto Alvarez's phone records that he had a five-second call to Michael Amir, he had a six-second call to Michael Amir, and an 88-second call to Michael Amir. So just giving him the bit, this is all at 12.18, so just giving him the benefit of the doubt, just, just, just saying it's 12.18, oh, 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 when he start, started making these phone calls. And we know that's not true because Michael Amir's phone records reflect something different. But let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm telling you, I'm just learning this yesterday, so bear with me. All right, thanks. 12, 18, 11. Two phone calls, five and six seconds. 12, 18, 11 is when he would have gotten hold of Michael Amir. 88 seconds later is 12, 19, 39. We know from the records that we subpoenaed from Beverly Hills that the 911 call went out at 12, 20, 21. 42 seconds, this is what, all right, hang on, this is what Alberto Alvarez said he did. Up on the landing, he hangs up the phone. He walks through the landing, through the foyer, into the room. He's in shock. He reaches, Dr. Murray says to him, we need an ambulance, get an ambulance. He reaches for his phone. The children come in. Paris and Prince are both upset. Paris is hysterical. Dr. Murray says, get them out of here. Don't let them see their father like this. He walks the children through the foyer to the door. He comforts the children. He said, and I'm sure you have notes of this, he said, please children, everything's going to be okay. I asked him, you didn't push him, did you? No, you care about those kids. Yes. <coughs> He walks back in, through the foyer, to the door. He s closes the door behind him. He asks Dr. Murray what happened. Dr. Murray says he had a bad reaction. He had a bad reaction. He said he surveyed the room. He was frozen, is what he said. Then he said he picked up the plastic bag. Dr. Murray supposedly handed him vials while he was in the middle of the bed. He didn't explain, but Dr. Murray had to reach over and hand him vials. He picked up a plastic bag. He put the plastic bag inside a brown bag that was on the floor. He walked to the IV stand, took off the IV bag, put the IV bag in another blue bag that was on the other side of the bed by that chair, and then he made his 911 call. And I asked, you think you could do that in 30 seconds? And he said, I'm efficient. That was his response. It's not efficient, it's impossible. Because he didn't tell the truth. But the prosecution doesn't care, because this is the foundation, the genesis of their bottle and a bag theory. That's the foundation. It starts with Alberto Alvarez, the two-month-later statement that there was a bottle in the bag. But there's more problems with their theory. There's more problems. You see, here's the problem. Elisa Fleek never mentioned a bottle in a bag. She <coughs> took, in the notes that she didn't destroy, there is no mention of a bottle in a bag. There are no photos of a vial in a bag. None. There is nothing in her chronology. The notes that she supposedly takes to, to show what's been happening in the investigation of the case. Nothing. In her investigative summary, which is a report, she talks about the lamp on the table, but never mentions a vial in a bag. For the first time, while this is being ready for preliminary hearing, 18 months later, all of a sudden, there's a bottle in a bag. 18 months later. There's no notes of it. She just conveniently remembered. I want 
you to remember Detective Smith. You know, I don't know how you feel about LAPD. I, I don't have any experience with LAPD. But I can tell you my experience with Detective Smith and Detective Myers and Detective Martinez, they are consummate professionals, excellent at what they do. They did an outstanding job investigating this case. They took notes on every single issue. They prepared evidence and presented it on every single issue. Now, you, we called some of them, I understand. You didn't hear from all of them, but you did hear from Detective Smith. And do you remember when Detective Smith took the stand? He sat up there, and he wasn't going to play ball on this vial in a bag theory. He wasn't going to do it. And when I asked him straight on, Detective Smith, was there a bottle in the bag? Not that I saw. And when I showed him his notes, where he methodically took notes of everything that came out of the bags that were found in the closet, everything, from beginning to end, I showed him that he even put in his notes that he found a lorazepam bottle in a bag that holds an IV bag. That's how methodical he was. And he made no notes of a vial in a bag, not one, because he didn't see it, because it wasn't there. Let's fast forward to April of 2011. Two weeks before the very first trial setting, they bring in Alberto Alvarez for an interview, for a conversation about his testimony. And Alberto Alvarez, on the 31st, on the left, draws that picture of what he saw on the stand. And in April of 2011, he draws that picture of the IV bag. And Detective Martinez told you that he brought all of the bags, all of the vials, all of the tubing, everything to this meeting at the district attorney's office. Everything. But the only thing they showed, the only thing they showed, Alberto Alvarez, was this bag, cut IV bag, and this vial, people's third. Now, what do you think what conversation do you think took place in that room that day? You think Alberto Alvarez isn't going to play ball? You think he doesn't know what they're asking him? And so, the theory is solidified. There was a vial in a bag. That's how there was a drip. There was a vial in the back. And why, why is it that the prosecution needs a drip? Because if Dr. Murray did what he said he did, there was no danger to Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was not going to die. And it doesn't matter whether you, you leave the room and you go outside and play basketball or you leave the house or you, or you make phone calls. It doesn't matter. Dr. Murray did not kill Michael Jackson. They need a drip. But the problems with their theory persist. You see, how do we explain if we're going to say there was a bottle in a bag, how do we explain the fact that Dr. Murray wouldn't have had to do that? Now you can see the tab that's on the propofol bottle, people starting. And you recall the exhibition Mr. Walgren showed you when he, when he walked around here and you heard the pop of people starting as he pulled the tab on the bottle. 
And then immediately thereafter, what happened is we all broke, and the next thing you saw was stipulation. Now, he was approaching Dr. Schaefer when he did that. What do you think Dr. Schaefer was going to do with that now unbridled bottle? Because after the stipulations, he didn't do anything with it. The problem with this is Dr. Murray didn't have to go through the ridiculous, absurd, step of cutting a bag, propping it up into a cut IV bag, hanging it where it could fall. He didn't have to do all that because all he had to do was hang it. And Dr. Schaefer was going to do exactly that. Dr. Schaefer was going to explain something else to you. Do you remember when Dr. Schaefer testified that, that this remember he, he showed this this IV to one? Remember that? And you remember when he, he he took it out and he hung it and he and he showed how he, you could do it this way. You could do it with two lines. Do you know why he did that? Do you know why he came up with that theory? Because looking at this particular evidence diagram, the problem was there was no way to get a propofol drip through a long tubing because the tubing that was at the scene was clear and clean, and there was nothing in the long tubing. What was in the short tubing was exactly what Dr. Murray said, propofol and lidocaine. But the long tubing, which would have been required for a drip, had nothing in it. So Dr. Schaefer sits up there, and he says, well, there had to be another tubing, and this tubing wouldn't have worked because this tubing is vented. And this tubing isn't. And I stood up here and I held it out for you. I wanted you to see it. And I had him point to the venting on this tubing. And it was obvious that this tubing also was vented. And then the next day, Dr. Schaefer comes in. And what did he say? Oh, you know what? I was, I was wrong about that. Despite the fact there's a man's future on the line, he just conveniently forgot that. This line is ridiculous anyway. This line is ordered by Dr. Murray's office on a regular basis. This line is used for an infusion pump. This line is too long. But they had to explain somehow why Dr. Mer why the, the lining, the long tube, was did not have any propofol in it. Because all Dr. Murray would have had to do is take it out and stick it in. What the prosecution did with Dr. Schaefer is they abrogated their responsibility to their their case. Dr. Schaefer is a pharmacokineticist. He's a computer modeler. Yes, he's an anesthesiologist as well. But instead of having police officers investigate the scene, or the coroner's office tell you what happened at the scene, they hired this man in April of 2011. April 2011, almost two years after the death of Michael Jackson despite the fact they had already had 13 other experts. And they tell Dr. Schaefer, you solved the crime for us. 
And Dr. Schaefer, who told you on cross-examination, and I didn't ask him this question, he told me, without me asking, I don't have an agenda. Work backwards, just like Mr. Walgren said, from a dose to concentration, and he kept working. And they turned him into a cop. And no, he didn't stand up here and tell you that these were possibilities. He stood up here, you remember, should be in your notes. He told you this is what happened. I want to say some things about Dr. Schaefer and versus Dr. White for a second because I just I just had to sit there and have Mr. Walgren say these things about Dr. White and I want to I want to defend him for a second. The reason you have experts, experts, they're supposed to be scientists. They come up here, they sit on the stand, they tell you about scientific principles, they tell you what's possible. They give you the tools that enable you to make determinations factually. But they don't take positions because scientists don't take positions. Good scientists don't. <coughs> And Dr. Schaefer got up here, and he was not a scientist. He was an advocate. He's trying to prove a point. He's trying to prove a case. And Dr. White, he sits up here. And what is Dr. White? Mr. Walgren played it. If Dr. White, completely honest, I don't have those qualifications. Did Dr. Schaefer ever say that? No, I wouldn't do what Dr. Murray did in that circumstance. Would Dr. Schaefer ever say that? If Dr. White wanted to be an advocate, he would have been an advocate. And to say that Dr. White doesn't have the credentials, oh, he used to be? You saw what Dr. White has done and what he has meant to this particular Society of Anesthesiologists. And Dr. White knows more about propofol than Dr. Schaefer will ever, ever know. And Dr. White sat up here and he just tried to tell you the truth. That's all he did. And he didn't have to for his $11,000. But Dr. Schaefer, because he thinks we won't know, that we won't figure this out, he gives you simulations, one right after the other, and none of them, except this last one, which we asked him to do, have anything to do with the case. I asked him, six injections, 100 milligrams, what did, where, did that, where did that come from? Because nothing, nothing, no statement, nothing, no facts, scenes at the, uh, facts at the scene, no evidence, nothing suggested that. In fact, he said, nobody would do that. But he provides that to you. Six injections, 50, same thing. There's, no, there's absolutely no evidence of injections, six injections. He shows you six, Murray, six injections, 50 milligrams. Propofol, 50. None of these things, none of these things ever showed up at the scene. Nobody ever suggested it. He just kept showing them to you. This propofol, 25 milligrams, he showed a, a rapid bolus over a 20 to 30 second period of time that nobody ever said happened. And why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because what he didn't want to tell you is when you work backwards from concentration to dose, you could do a million of these. But what he wanted you to believe is that he had, he had, observed, he had, he had considered every possibility and I asked him on cross, do you have a computer program that will determine, if you have the dose, determine concentration? Or concentration can determine dose, and what do you say? Well, that's not even possible. There's an infinite number of possibilities. And then he continued to work backwards from these possibilities to tell you what happened at the scene and demonstrate it for you, like he was a cop, because that's what he was hired to do because they wanted a drip and none existed. 
This is the only thing Dr. Schaefer ever has done that actually relates to the facts of this case. Because this is what Dr. Murray did. Over three to five minutes provided 25 milligrams of propofol. This is what Dr. Murray did. We had to ask him to do this. And he did this. And you can see that based on what Dr. Murray did, there is no danger to Michael Jackson. There is no harm to Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson cannot die from what Dr. Murray did. And Dr. Schaefer even admitted that. Now, why would Dr. Schaefer present this 25 milligram simulation <coughs> to you? And not this. Is he a scientist? Is he an advocate? You recall this is the 10, 10 lorazepam simulation that Dr. Schaefer showed you. Do you remember that? <coughs> 10 shots, 4 milligrams each. I asked him, he, he, the, the only reason that he even came up with this simulation, the only reason, is because there was an empty vial of lorazepam at the scene in one of the bags. That's the only reason. <coughs> but in order to get this concentration at 12, this is what he came up with. Working backwards, he decided 10 shots every 30 minutes to get to where he needed to be. As ridiculous as that is, I asked him, what about this line here that I had to draw in? What about that line there where, where you, in your report where it said not responsive to painful stimulus? Where's that line? Why is it out of your diagram when, that you showed to the jury? And his response, that he didn't think the jury could understand it. It's just too complicated. That one line. I'll tell you why he didn't want you to see it. Because this isn't an analgesic. This is a sedative. And after these many shots, four shots, this, this particular individual is so knocked out from lorazepam, he can't even feel painful stimulus. So it would require Dr. Murray to give four more shots, five, five more shots, when this particular individual is comatose. And he didn't want anyone to know that. And then I ask him, well, what about here, this, this midnight, this first shot he gets, he's, he's, at the, he's at the Staples Center. Oh, he is? And what about the second one? He's not even home yet. He's in a car. Oh, oh, he is? And the next day he comes back and he brings a nine shot moves it over, nine shot, four milligram, which just proves my point. If you're an advocate, you can come up with anything you want to prove the case that you're hired to prove. And that's exactly what he did. Prosecution desperately needed a drift. Not because they couldn't prove that Dr. Murray made mistakes. Not because they couldn't prove that Dr. Murray was a, um, did the things that other doctors wouldn't. They needed a drip because they can't prove a crime. And they really need to prove a crime. I asked Dr. Schaefer. We, we had this whole lorazepam, oral lorazepam issue. I asked him, 
about free lorazepam in the stomach. Would, would, that, would that show that, that, Michael, that Michael Jackson swallowed lorazepam? Yes. But it's, what did the prosecution tell you over and over again? Well, it's just one twenty-sixth of a pill. It's just one three-hundredth of a pill. As if you're not, you don't, you wouldn't understand that pills dissolve. And the medicine in those pills eventually go into the bloodstream. But if there's any free lorazepam in the stomach, the one thing you know is that Michael Jackson swallowed lorazepam. And why would Dr. Murray, who's already given two milligrams of lorazepam on two different occasions, give him pills? Because that was the response when Dr. Schaefer came back on rebuttal. Well, we don't know whether or not Dr. Murray gave this pill, right? What did he say? Right. Same metabolic pathway. But during his testimony, he never mentioned. And I, I'm sorry for this. This is a bad... I know I realize I did a bad job on this. But this is an exhibit. This is just math. You could keep going. One, two, five. Down to... to well, 075, something like that. But you keep going every 22 minutes. So finally, you can get down to 0 .08, 0 .008. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't take very long for that to happen because it's, it's essentially exponential. The difference between 16 milligrams and 32 milligrams at, at, at one point is 22 minutes. But what we do know, what we do know is that Michael Jackson swallowed lorazepam. And despite all of that, did you see one single oral lorazepam simulation from Dr. Schaefer? Of course you didn't. Because that's not going to help the prosecution. And Dr. Schaefer is an advocate. We provided you that. We did. And by the way, when Dr. Schaefer came back in rebuttal, he didn't say a word about this. He didn't say anything about whether this was right or wrong. Not a word. Let me take a look at this. This is Dr. Schaefer's graph, which shows how he gets to 12 o'clock. This is exactly the same ending place with two with, with swallowing swallowing lorazepam. Now, we're not telling you, and Dr. Watt didn't tell you that this is what happened, because he never told you what happened, because he's a scientist. He's not a cop. But he tried to explain to you why you can get to the exact same place with oral lorazepam, not just injectable lorazepam. But Dr. Schaefer didn't bother, because it didn't fit. You were given, you were provided two scenarios in this case. And you were, by the way, you were given a charge in this case about two reasonable scenarios involving circumstantial evidence. And I encourage you to read it because what it tells you is if there are two reasonable scenarios, you have to choose the one that points towards acquittal. But you have two reasonable scenarios about lorazepam. And the first one is that Dr. Murray gave 10 4 milligram doses to an already comatose Michael Jackson. Or Michael Jackson went into his personal bathroom and swallowed lorazepam. And Dr. Murray didn't know it. Now, what's more reasonable to you? At some point, and the prosecution hasn't said it yet, but they're going to have to. They're going to have to tell you that what they're really asking you to do. Just say it. What they're really asking you to do is to convict Dr. Murray for the actions of Michael Jackson. And I'm going to... 
you know, we've been dancing around this for six weeks, maybe two years. Somebody's got to say it. Somebody's got to tell the truth. Somebody's got to just say it. If it were anybody else but Michael Jackson, anybody else, would this doctor be here today? The jury instructions tell you that in order to convict Dr. Murray, you would have to believe from a criminal negligence standpoint that his actions amounted to a disregard for human life, indifference to the consequences. Now, you met Dr. Murray's patients. You saw Ruby Mosley and Jerry Causey. You saw Andy. You know what Dr. Murray did for these people. That they're willing to drive down here, fly down here, get up on the stand in front of all these cameras. Does Dr. Murray, did he appear to you from these witnesses who, by the way, Mr. Walgreen decided to poo-poo because they've only been patients for 10 years and, Do and Dr. Murray only treated him in 2003, did these people appear to you to believe, people that know Dr. Murray best, that Dr. Murray has an indifference to the consequences of his act, that he has a disregard for human life? I encourage you to please listen to the entire interview of Dr. Murray. Not snippets. Don't just take five words. Listen to the whole interview, please. And you listen to how he says things. You listen to what he says. About how he feels about Michael Jackson. About how he's always felt about Michael Jackson. And you listen, and by the way, Mr. Walgren telling you that Dr. Murray just made a made the statement because he's trying to get ahead of the curve, ahead of the police. If Dr. Murray's trying to get ahead of the police, why did Dr. Murray tell the police that for 60 days he's giving Michael Jackson propofol infusions? Don't you think Dr. Murray could have come up with a, since we're all so brilliant, we're tricking the police, don't you think he could have come up with a better story? This is criminal negligence. This is the definition of criminal negligence. The prosecution has shown negligence in many different respects. One of the disturbing things about what Mr. Warren told you was, as I told you, what he said about substantial as opposed to having to prove direct. This is actually what he's going to have to prove to convict Dr. Murray. This is the actual jury instructions. These are the three questions that I submit to you that as you go through the list of negligent acts, and as I recall, Mr. Walgren pointed to propofol in the home. He pointed to, to um, um, uh, failure to obtain medical records. I'm, I'm assuming you wrote this down. These are the three questions that you need to ask yourself in every single one of those scenarios. Did Dr. Murray commit criminal negligence? Number one, with that act. Two, is it the direct cause of Michael Jackson's death? And it's defined for you in the charge. This is your charge. Whatever I tell you is, is essentially irrelevant. What Mr. Wargren tells you is irrelevant. This is your charge. And you will see exactly what you need to look at. And finally, is it the natural and probable consequence of the act? Taking into account intervening circumstances. Mr. Walgren has told you that Dr. Murray, he... He's going to have to get up here, and he's going to have to tell you that, okay, maybe, I, maybe the drip theory was a bad one, and, I, and it doesn't work. 
He's going to have to. Because he's not going to point to the fact that there were baggy pants and say that that's any evidence whatsoever that Dr. Murray took one thing from the house, a wet tubing, left a bottle, left the bags. He took one thing, picked up things in front of paramedics, right in front of them, but left, but took one thing. It's absurd. So what he's going to say on rebuttal is, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, because it doesn't matter. And one of the things he pointed to are these doctors that got up on the stand. And they sat up here. And they looked down on Dr. Murray. And they said, I would have done it differently. I would have done things differently. It is easy, in hindsight, to sit up and point the finger at your colleague and say whatever the prosecution wants you to say. It's easy to do that, especially when you are you're Dr. Murray, who has to walk through this world painted as a villain for everything that he does. It's easy in hindsight to say that he's a lousy doctor. But these doctors, Dr. Kamengar, Dr. Steinberg, and Dr. Schaefer have never been in the shoes of Conrad Murray, ever. It's easy to make those statements when you've never walked in that man's shoes. It's easy to make those, st those statements when you've never had a patient and a friend like Michael Jackson. And it's easy to make those statements when you have a minuscule amount of compassion compared to Dr. Murray. You can judge Dr. Murray for what he did, but don't question his motives. Dr. Murray, his greatest personality defect is his greatest character strength. He got brought into this situation because he thought he could help. Because he thought he could help. He could help Michael Jackson succeed. He could help him sleep normally. He believed that. He was wrong. He was wrong. Because Dr. Murray had no control over this situation. Because what was happening in the background, he was just a little fish in a big, dirty pond. The prosecution says it's bizarre what Dr. Murray did with the 911 call. Bizarre. That's what he said, bizarre. And Dr. Steinberg sat up here and he told you, Steinberg and Kamengar and Schaefer, and they told you, the first thing you do when you find your patient dying on the bed in front of you, is you call 911. First thing you do. Really? Really? You're a doctor in a private residence. Your one patient is lying on the bed, unable to breathe, his eyes open, and he looks like he's dead. You have no idea why. None. You're a cardiologist and you're trained in advanced life support. And the first thing you do is you pick up the phone and call 911. Would anybody do that? Anybody? Is it disregard for human life or indifference to the consequences of that act? to try to revive your patient first? And what did Dr. Steinberg say when pushed? What did he say? Okay, you know what? Maybe two minutes you can try to revive your patient, then call 911. He literally chose a time. Not one minute, 
That's okay. Two minutes. And then after that, it's a felony. Just pulls a, a, a number out of, the, out of his head. Two minutes. Well, let's look at what Dr. Murray actually did. You see jury instructions in deciding whether a consequence is natural and probable. Consider all the circumstances established by the evidence. It's the same thing with negligence. The circumstances. What did Dr. Murray actually do? He tries to revive Michael Jackson. Tries immediately to provide CPR. Immediately. When that doesn't work, he injects him with flumazenil. <coughs> with flumazenil. It's a reversal agent for lorazepam. There is no reversal agent for propofol. Injects him with flumazenil. That doesn't work. He runs down the stairs. We're seeing him as on these stairs. His eyes bulging out. He's frantic. And he tells Kai Chase, help. Get security. Now Kai Chase says, well, he said get security in print. I'm going to suggest to you that that's not what he said. It doesn't matter, but I'm going to suggest to you that what Kai Chase actually did was get Prince. And Kai Chase knew, because she told Prince, there's something wrong with your father. She knew. When all that Kai Chase had to do was walk out of that door and go to this trailer where the security was. So you know that Dr. Murray runs downstairs, wants security, and he expects Kai Chase to get exactly that, to get security. It's right there by the kitchen. All she had to do is stick her head out, help. That's it. And remember where we are. This is a 14,000 square foot mansion, three stories, nobody allowed upstairs. <coughs> security around the perimeter. You heard what Fahim Muhammad said. Nobody gets in, not ambulance, not police, not family, without them going upstairs to check. So what's the time savings from them going upstairs to check versus Dr. Murray come down to get them? It's exactly the same thing. But it's bizarre. And he wants to base it, Mr. Walgren, base it on Kai Chase's timeline, where it just so happens, two years earlier, she remembers checking her cell phone just right before Dr. Murray came down. Fine. Let's just assume that's what she did. Let's just assume that. By Dr. Steinberg's own expert testimony, two minutes, he should have called 911. And this is Richard Sennett's run sheet. This is when they were on the scene, 1225. This is when he's upstairs, 1226. So if Dr. Murray had called immediately after finding Michael Jackson, you're still looking at seven minutes before he got help. And where are these experts say that Dr. Murray should have just stood above Michael Jackson and got on the phone, called 911. This 911 call that was transferred from Beverly Hills after 40 seconds and then finally to, to LA, Los Angeles, was 163 seconds. Now, if Dr. Murray had done that, don't you just know that they'd be up here telling you that that was an extreme deviation from the standard of care? Just know it. Is it warm in here for you, or is it just me? No? Okay. Well, we should be talking to you asking for information. <laughs> Go ahead.
get up here on the stand, Steinberg and Kamengar, and they tell you, Dr. Murray performed substandard CPR. And what do they base it on? Because Dr. Murray gave CPR on the bed. That's it. Since Dr. Murray didn't drag Michael Jackson down on the floor, he therefore did not give him CPR. It was a deviation from the standard of care because he didn't drag him down from the bed. The purpose of CPR, and they agreed with this, the purpose of it is that you would provide compression and ventilation. That's what saves lives. Ventilation has nothing to do with whether Michael Jackson's on the bed. Compression, under these circumstances, with Dr. Murray at six foot five, 240 pounds, one hand behind Michael Jackson's back, and one on top of Michael Jackson's chest, pressing down, do you honestly believe there was insufficient compression? And nobody, by the way, nobody's ever presented any evidence that there was insufficient compression. And yet these experts are willing to get up here and tell you that it was a violation of the standard of care. And there's no evidence of it. This despite the fact that the American Heart Association tells you. You do CPR where you find the patient. But they're willing to get up here and tell you that. Why? Why is it that everything Dr. Murray did, you know, he, he, did, he did wrong things. We, we, we told you that. But why is it that every single thing Dr. Murray did has to be a standard deviation of standard of care? Ask yourself that. They, tell, they say Dr. Murray provided insufficient ventilation because he didn't use an ambu bag. Well, there it is. Well, what's it out for? Doc, Mr. Warren says he never said he used an ambu bag. There it is. It's not the paramedics they told you. What's it doing out there? And if you listen to the transcript, listen to the tape of the interview with the police, you'll hear Dr. Murray say there was sufficient ventilation. Yes, at some point he did mouth to mouth, but that doesn't mean he always did mouth to mouth. And in any case, is that a conscious indifference to human life? Why is it that everything is a deviation. Everything's a deviation because Dr. Murray has to go down. Dr. Murray has to go down. And for him to go down, there's got to be a drip. And everybody's on board. All the witnesses are on board. What the prosecution doesn't want to tell you, I'll tell you. It's why, the, why, it's why in this trial, here's what you saw. You saw witnesses that, that, that didn't need to testify. You know why these, why these people that Dr. Murray called or that called Dr. Murray was on the stand? It had nothing to do with the phone records. You know what the deal, deal is with that. You know what it was. And three witnesses, they showed pictures of the children. There's no relevance on that. It's heartbreaking to see those kids. You know that, and I know that. That's why they showed the pictures. You didn't have to identify the kids. Brought in Nicole Alvarez. To prove what? To prove that there, were, that, that there was packages delivered to her house? We had FedEx receipts. We had applied pharmacy records. He tells you... in his argument about how there's uh, gallons of propofol. But now you know there has to be gallons of propofol if, if Dr. Murray's telling the truth about what he gave Michael Jackson. You know, 
one of the things that, that they tried to, and they didn't argue this, so maybe, maybe there's a reason. There's just there's this tremendous desire to paint Dr. Murray as this villain. This per, uh, this, they want to paint a perfect villain and a perfect victim. As if we're in a television show and we want to break for commercial and we want to feel good about the movie as it ends. There's no perfect villain and there's no perfect victim. They tell you that Dr. Murray, they try to imply to you that Dr. Murray ran from the hospital. But now, you, I mean, you saw, you saw what they showed you. They showed this picture, this grainy picture of him in the, in the waiting area. And he's leaving the hospital. And he's going outside. And they say, well, where's that lead? It goes outside. He's on the run. He's on the run. And then it takes... We find out later that that's the direct route to the West Wing. And you find out that that's exactly where he went. Because at 502, that's where he was. And then we have to bring in Amir Rubin to tell you that Dr. Murray went over there and talked to the lawyers about the press release. But if we hadn't done all that, what would be the impression that was left? What would be the unfair impression that was left for you? Why? Why what's the need to do that? And by the way, why, when could Dr. Murray have left the hospital? It was literally two and a half hours when the, we had the last video since Michael Jackson was pronounced dead. Dr. Murray was the only man at the hospital, the only person at the hospital without transportation because he rode in the ambulance. They tell you about Michael Amir saying that Dr. Murray wanted to go back to the house. Well... It's believable that Dr. Murray wanted to go back to the house to get his car. His car was there. It's believable that Dr. Murray wanted to go home. It's believable that he wanted to go eat. It's not believable that Michael Amir, when Dr. Murray says to him, allegedly, I want to go back to the house to get some cream, that he was so disturbed by that that he locked the house down and then told Fahim Muhammad to lie to Dr. Murray. And yet at the same time on that day, he spoke to the police twice and he never once <coughs> mentioned. It was the trio of Fahim Muhammad and Michael Amir Williams and Alberto Alvarez in their lawyer's office over two months later, they came up with this. And who would know about cream being used by Michael Jackson? Michael Amir Williams would. Everybody's on the team. Everybody's willing to go for it. play you this voicemail again. Did we fail? Uh, yeah, Dr. Murray, it's Frank DeLeo, Michael's manager. I'm the short guy with uh, no hair. Uh, would you please call me at 213-304-9110? Um, uh, I'm sure you're aware he had an episode last night. Uh, he's sick. Today's Saturday. Tomorrow I'm on my way back. I'm not going to continue my trip. Um, I think you need. I think you need to get a blood test on him today. I, I, we got to see what he's doing. All right. Thank you.
Dr. Murray was jettisoned in this whole situation two months prior. What Dr. Murray knew about Michael Jackson's situation was what he knew from his treatment of him in Vegas. Well, he did not know. And Randy Phillips told you that, that rather than tell him about what, what Michael Jackson was doing in the background, he just simply cryptically said that he's seeing Arnold Klein. So on June 19th, this voicemail was sent from Frank DeLeo. And it said, and you heard it, he says, we need to figure out what he's doing. Well, it's really not what he's doing. It's what's being done to him. See, Michael Jackson... And you can tell this by Kenny Ortega's email. And Randy Phillips denied this, of course. Michael Jackson was under a tremendous, <coughs> abnormal, <coughs> impossible amount of pressure by AEG. And it wasn't just related to his trips to Arnold Klein's office. It was related to his appearances at rehearsals. So when Kenny Ortega says in his email to Randy Phillips, you know, we threatened to pull the plug. You can read the email. It's, it's number one on the exhibit list. We tried tough love. You can sense, you can see what Michael Jackson is going through during this entire process. Now, during this period of time as well, Michael Jackson is visiting Arnold Klein, according to Fahim Muhammad essentially every day. And you saw at least a sample of what was happening in Michael Jackson's life. But as I told you in the opening statement, Michael Jackson compartmentalized these issues. Dr. Murray is a part of that. Now let's be clear about what Dr. Murray actually did. You can judge, and I, and I, I can't disagree, giving propofol, whether giving propofol in the home is an appropriate thing to do. And for 60 days, he did that. Infusion for 60 days. But Dr. Murray provided a drug, not a controlled substance, to a patient for a specific medical condition. He did not give Demerol to Michael Jackson. He did not provide him drugs to fuel some addiction. And if Dr. Murray were inclined to do that, then you would have seen that. So Dr. Murray goes home during the day, and the other life is taken over. The crux of this case, the ultimate crux of this case, when it all comes down to it, is the prosecution believes and will argue to you that Michael Jackson, that Dr. Murray should be responsible for Michael Jackson self-administering. That Dr. Murray should be responsible for that. And Dr. Steinberg got up on the stand, and I know this was a sound bite, but it was just incredibly aggravating. He gets up on the stand and he says that Dr. Murray in treatment of Michael Jackson was like a baby on a countertop. Remember that line? And it was the most insulting possible thing you can say about Michael Jackson. As if this fully formed 50-year-old man was just a baby. And he had absolutely no ability to make decisions for himself. That he, that he couldn't make contracts for himself. That he couldn't raise his children for himself because he's just a baby. Mr. Warren is absolutely right. 
Michael Jackson is an adult. He makes his own decisions. He had plans for the future, and he knew exactly what he was doing. And if you're going to hold Dr. Murray responsible, if you're going to say that he's responsible for the specific and unusual acts of Michael Jackson, if you're going to say that, and his, much Waldron's response is, well, Michael Jackson once said that a doctor let him push it in. One time. And what was Dr. Murray's response? Not on my watch. So was Dr. Murray supposed to watch Michael Jackson to save him from himself at all times? Was he never to leave? Should there be alarm in the bed? At what point do you draw the line about Dr. Murray's responsible responsibility for a grown-up. And if you're going to go that far, since now you know from Dr. Schaefer and Dr. White that Michael Jackson didn't just die of propofol, he died from a combination of propofol and a load of lorazepam. Because the propofol alone, Dr. Schaefer told you, wouldn't have killed him. So now are we going to hold Dr. Murray responsible for that as well? One of the, you know, I understand it's a touchy thing to say. Nobody wants to say it. And I want you to take this case out of Michael Jackson. Take it away from Michael Jackson. Think about that. Take it away. Let's put it somewhere else. Let's put it in a psych hospital. If some patient kills himself. Put it in a hospital where some patient breaks into a, into, into a cabinet. Put it in a family situation where, where somebody overdoses. Put it anywhere you like. But at least if you make, if you're going to hold Dr. Murray responsible, don't do it because it's Michael Jackson. This is not a reality show. It's reality. And the decisions you make isn't making good TV. It's how it affects real human beings and people that love them. So I hope that you do the right thing and find Dr. Murray not guilty. Thank you. Mr. Chernoff, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take the mid-afternoon break. Of course, please remember all the admonishments. Approximately 15 minutes for the break. Thank you.